lunar localized dark mantle deposits. Thank you. So, yeah, we're going to talk about volcanic glass and lunar localized dark mantle deposits. So, with this project, we had three main scientific questions that we hope to answer. First of all, what are the spectral characteristics broadly of lunar localized dark mantle deposits, or DMDs, as I'll call them? Uh, secondly, how much spectral variability exists within uh, each of these localized DMDs? And what are the eruption conditions present? in the localized DMDs. So we're going to keep those three questions in mind as we go through the project. So for anyone who is not a lunar volcanologist, uh, dark mantle deposits are deposits of fine-grained, low albedo material that are believed to be volcanic in origin. So these come in two flavors. The largest uh, we call large or regional deposits. Uh, these can be quite large, greater than 1,000 square kilometers. Uh, and as you can see, they're dark, low albedo. Uh, the regional deposits generally mantle topographic highs near mare-filled basins. You can see that uh, here's a deposit of mare that's embaying these dark mantle deposits. And the smaller deposits we refer to as localized. And uh, these can be less than 1,000 square kilometers. They can go down to tens of square kilometers. These generally occur in floor fractured craters, as Jim just mentioned. And Lauren Joswiak will go into more detail in a later talk. Um, and you can see, again, these have low albedo. They appear to be fine-grained. And these generally occur on floor fractures in these floor fractured craters and generally contain at least one or sometimes multiple circular or subcircular volcanic vents. Uh, so if we talk about distribution of these, generally the regional and localized, so large and small DMDs, occur near the edges of mare-filled basins or in more isolation in those floor fractured craters, uh, as we talked about. But generally, they occur fairly widespread across the, across the moon um, and at qu quite a large range of latitudes as well. So uh, given what we know about those, um, we can say, what are the emplacement conditions? And so as I hope people know, uh, several of the Apollo missions went to uh, locations in the moon where they returned volcanic glass. So here you can see maybe this orange area uh, that is actually orange in color. Some samples that were returned uh, had large percents of orange and black beads, which are actually volcanic glass. Um, this is from the Apollo 17 mission, and uh, in the Apollo 15 mission, deposits of green glass were also returned, and those are actually quite green if you haven't seen them before. So if we take spectra of these volcanic glasses, uh, we can see in this plot here, this is wavelength, not wave number, in case you can't see the axis. This is visible to near-infrared wavelengths. And we have reflectance on the y-axis. Uh, the spectra of these various volcanic glasses vary a little bit, and that has to do with the variations in the composition of the glass. But in general, the glasses are characterized by these broad absorption bands, a little bit long of 1,000 nanometers and a little bit short of 2,000 nanometers. And they have this asymmetry, generally, in the bands, and this red slope. So keep that in mind. We're going to come to that later. Um, but again, there is a little bit of variability in the spectra of the different compositions of volcanic glasses. So given that we know that these DMDs, the dark mantle deposits, are volcanic in nature, they're fine-grained, we can ask the question, that's great, but why do we care about them? Uh, so from a scientific perspective, these DMDs are characteristic, we believe, of volatile ridge volcanism, which have implications for volcanic history throughout the evolution of the moon. Um, but also they have a wide range of mafic mineralogical diversity. And specifically, these deposits generally have high quantities of titanium, uh, of ilmenite, which is titanium oxide. So if we talk about potential lunar habitats on the moon, if we need titanium, if we need oxygen, we can extract these from the ilmenite that's present in these deposits. Um, other potential exploration uh, Implications of these DMDs is that these are very fine-grained deposits. That makes it easier to extract resources from the deposits. Um, in some of these papers that I reference here, it's talked about maybe digging under the dark mantle deposits for radiation shielding. Uh, so uh, uh, finally, these deposits, as I showed, are widely dispersed across the surface of the moon. So wherever we would like to send humans, there could be a DMD in close proximity to it. So that could be. Uh, a potential landing site, habitable site, uh, for future human exploration. So as I mentioned for my project here, I'm going to be specifically looking at these localized pyroclastic deposits. And so for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on Alphonsus Crater, which is my favorite. Uh, it has these three 
sub deposits, as we call them, three deposits uh, that are isolated from each other of this dark mantle material. Again, they have these low albedo, they occur on these fractures with these central vents. And I analyzed this and several other deposits using uh, visible to near infrared spectral data. So the moon mineralogy mapper, or M cubed spectral data, to analyze the composition and try to detect volcanic glass. What you can do with the M-cubed data is create these spectral maps and then assign different parameters to color bands to really highlight the differences in the composition of the deposits. So as you can see here, hopefully with the colors, there's these three separate subdeposits with fractures extending throughout the floor of the crater. Uh, in a 1,000 nanometer albedo map in the M-cubed data, you can really see that these are quite dark compared to the floor of the crater. And you can just see a little patch of mare nubium, mare basalts that are just to the west of the crater. And then if you assign different spectral parameters based on the m cube data, you can see that these deposits are quite spectrally distinct from the surrounding crater material. Uh, and they're more similar to the mare basalt. But if you assign different color parameters, you can see that the dark mantle deposits are maybe a slightly different color from the mare basalt. So there could be some sort of spectral uh, difference uh, between those two units. So if you look closely at each of these uh, subdeposits, I'm looking at the southeast deposit here, you can again see that low albedo, fine grain nature, and the very diffuse edges to the deposit. This is a, in a Kagaya terrain camera image. Using a 1,000 nanometer M cubed image, you can see that there are slight variations in albedo, slightly darker patches, slightly lighter patches, and again, this really diffuse uh, edge to the deposit. So I wanted to go in and actually pull out the spectra of these different albedo areas and see if that refers to uh, a spectral difference as well. So moving to the western subdeposit here, there's again three separate volcanic vents in this subdeposit. And so what I did is I took spectra inside the vent, and then uh, in a darkest unit outside the vent, in a lighter and in a lightest unit. And you can see that there is a variation in reflectance or in the albedo of these deposits. Again, this is wavelength on the x-axis, reflectance on the y-axis. Uh, and if you perform a continuum removal, basically uh, remove the slope of these spectra, you can see that other than an albedo difference, you have quite a large uh, spectral difference as well in the position and the depth of the one micron absorption band and a bit in the two micron absorption band between the vent spectrum, this red one, and then a dark intermediate and light albedo. So as you move further away from the central volcanic vent. Uh, and this variation in albedo and spectral position is reflected through all of the subdeposits taken on uh, the west, southeast, and northeast. So we interpreted this transition uh, in the position of the one micron band to represent mixtures at uh, spatial scales smaller than the resolution of the m cubed instrument. So basically, you have a thicker deposit of this dark mantle material uh, closer to the volcanic vent, but that gets thinner as you move further off of the deposit, which makes sense since it has these diffuse edges that you can see in those uh, close-up images. The other important thing we wanted to uh, note in these spectra is that you see that there's quite a large asymmetry in the one micron band. And it looks as if the one micron band is shifted to slightly longer wavelengths than 1,000 nanometers. And the 2,000 nanometer absorption band is shifted to slightly shorter wavelengths. So we interpret this to indicate a presence of volcanic glass, as we talked about earlier. You have this quite red slope in these spectra. You have this asymmetry in the one micron band and the sort of pinched together nature of the one and two micron bands. And again, that's reflected through all of the uh, vent spectra uh, in the Alphonsus crater. Uh, so the next thing we wanted to do was to compare the spectra of the dark mantle deposits to the crater floor and to the surrounding mare basalts. And the crater floor spectrum didn't show up on here, but you can see the mare basalt spectra are these black and gray spectra here uh, and here. And in the continuum removed spectra, you can see that the one micron band is quite symmetric uh, compared to the dark mantle deposit, the red and the blue spectra here. And the two micron band of the basalts are shifted to much longer wavelengths than the dark mantle deposits. So again, this distinction you can see between the basalts and the dark mantle deposits we're interpreting to represent uh, volcanic glass. And if you could see the crater floor spectrum, I promise that the absorption is just a bit short um, of where the spectra from the dark mantle deposit were trending, which represents um, the thinning of the deposit from the vent to the crater floor. Uh, so, again, what are the implications of detecting volcanic glass in these spectra? So, uh, Whites et al. 1999 studied these larger regional deposits that we have returned samples from the Apollo astronauts. Uh, and in these deposits, we detected a large concentration of glass 
uh, at far distances from the believed volcanic vent. And that's because when you have an eruption in these large-scale fire fountain-style eruptions from the regional dark mantle deposits, you form an eruptive plume. And so what happens is the temperatures and what we call optical densities are quite high, close to the volcanic vent. So in this number four and three region, uh, material can sustain itself within the volcanic plume for longer, so it can crystallize. And so you're, not, you're going to have very crystalline material. Material that's at the edges of the volcanic plume experience cooler temperatures. Uh, so that material can quench more quickly, inhibiting crystallization. So you're going to get glassy materials at the edges of the volcanic plume compared to at the vent. So in the large regional deposits, we would expect to see glass further from the volcanic vent. We saw the strongest asymmetry in, those, in the spectra from Alphonsus, the strongest glass signature, close to the volcanic vent. So instead of volcanic glass far away, we saw it close to the vent. So what does that mean for the localized, these smallest dark mantle deposit eruptions? Uh, and we are concluding that in the localized deposits, you're having a much smaller uh, eruptive plume and much shorter residence times of material in the volcanic plume. So you can quench material very quickly after it's erupted. And so in that case, you have a low optical density and low temperatures throughout the emplacement. Uh, the other alternative is that you have multiple eruptions of decreasing magnitude. So you erupt material, it quenches and it falls down. The next eruption is a little bit less strong, so the material can't travel as far. So it quenches and falls a bit closer to the vent. And finally, the, the final eruption is the smallest. Material quenches, forms glass, it, for it falls closest to the vent. Um, we're still working on that model. Um, but for now, we think that it probably is likely that the eruptions were smaller uh, and potentially repeated relative to the larger regional deposits. Uh, and so I only mentioned Alphonsus in this talk. We've also analyzed several other uh, localized dark mantle deposits. Several of those contained this asymmetric one micron band that could be indicative of volcanic glass, such as J. Herschel and Oppenheimer craters. Others have detected this volcanic glass signature in several other localized dark mantle deposits. But uh, Lavoisier, if you see this pink spectrum, doesn't necessarily have that shoulder, that asymmetry. So this could represent a glass-free localized DMD. And the question is, why are some localized DMDs glassy, and why are some glass-free? Uh, and that's what we're working on now. So hopefully I can tell you at the next uh, exploration forum for survey. So in conclusion, the Alphonsus dark mantle deposit and several others are characterized by mafic spectral signatures uh, unique from nearby Mare basalts that have variable uh, mixtures with the substrate depending on the distance from the volcanic vent. These glassy signatures were identified in Alphonsus crater and several others, which we interpreted to be volcanic glass. Um, the glassy signatures were enhanced closer to the volcanic vent rather than farther away in the regional deposits, uh, suggesting uh, short, repeated, potentially cooler eruptions than in the regional deposits. Um, and further analyses will place quantitative constraints on eruption conditions. Thank you. Do we have, we have time for questions? Hello, I'm Bob Garfinkel. You showed where you analyzed the um, Mari material just to the west of Alfonso. Did you also analyze the dark kind of triangular shape uh, area just almost right up against the exterior wall opposite the uh, dark halo crater that's uh, to the south, to the east right there in the middle? You just had it there. You so show Mari Basalt. The, this one. Yeah, right about where the where it says Cayuga uh, TC Evening uh, Mosaic. Right in that area, there's a, a triangular shaped dark uh, area on the uh, right on the terrain. It just it's outside the crater, just outside. Oh, okay. Uh, to the right there, so, where, where so you're in your here, upper slide you to the right, mm -hmm. where you say I mean to the left. I'm sorry, to the left. Where it says Cayuga TC Evening Mosaic. Oh, sure. Mosaic. Oh, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right so there, there's a dark is... area. Did you analyze that area, too? Yeah, so this is just a larger uh, view of the same crater. So the deposit of Mare Nubium basalt actually is this whole area here. So that would extend all the way right here. So this whole area is that deposit of Mare Nubium basalt. So yeah, we took different areas in the Mare basalt that we're calling mature and immature Mare. So the immature mare is near a region of small craters that expose fresher material that haven't been space weathered as much. And then the mature basalt is areas that is relatively more
crater free. Um, and so the spectra look quite similar, but the mature spectra has uh, more of a signature of space weathering than the immature Mari. So the absorption bands are much deeper uh, and easier to interpret in the immature basalt that was exposed more recently. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. To move on to our uh, next speaker.